Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ulster Beekeepers Winter Webinar Seminars. Um, the reason for these seminars is we normally hold a conference at this time of the year, uh, uh, but unfortunately, sort of in last year and this year, this has been uh, just impossible because of COVID. So we have decided really to have this series of webinars instead. Uh, this year, there's a series of seven webinars every Wednesday, uh, for the first seven Wednesdays in the new year. And I'm delighted really that the first uh, webinar will be given by Celia Davis, uh, and it's aimed really at less experienced beekeepers. Uh, I'd like to say is that we are very dependent upon our sponsors for having these webinars. And I'm indeed delighted to say that our sponsor this, this evening is McLernan, so the packaging company or the packaging center. And they in fact supply uh, all sorts of jars and, um, and uh, various, all different sizes of jars to do with uh, honey, um, uh, to get to store honey. Now, uh, in fact, McLernan's have in fact got a, a, an offer on for um, Ulster Beekeeper members uh, at the moment, which is 10% of all, all, all of our glass jars to the end of January. And so uh, we're delighted to do that. They are indeed uh, very, very generous at sponsoring uh, events for us and indeed very grateful to them for that. Now, the, uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen that there's, uh, there's two uh, really areas that you can uh, make chats into. There's a chat line which we would like you really to say where you are from and, uh, and to use that really just for uh, for pleasantries. If you wish to ask a question, there is a Q&A box and we would prefer that if you wish to ask a question is that you will put your questions in the Q&A box. There will be a 15 minute session at the end of the lecture in which uh, uh, Celia will in fact uh, answer questions. Now, I do hope that we will get through plenty of questions. But uh, um, I think it's one of these sort of things that, unfortunately, if it happens to be that we run over that time, you may not be able to have your answer uh, or your question answered. Now, I will actually say that these webinars for the next seven weeks are free. Uh, and indeed, we are, in fact, uh, very dependent on, very, on sponsorship that they do take place. However, if you do feel that you would like to make a contribution towards the webinars, then please feel free to do so. And you can do so by contacting our treasurer uh, and uh, he will in fact uh, link you to uh, how you'll be able to make a donation. So his contact details are ubkatreasurer at gmail.com. That's ubkatreasurer at gmail.com. Okay. Now, I'd certainly like to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Celia Davis. Um, Celia is possibly one of the best teachers uh, in, in bee science in the United Kingdom and has been um, a, a teacher for a beekeeper to many, many beekeepers over many, many years. Her interest in, in insects began when she was a child and initially focused on butterflies and moths. Uh, which a group which is still very interested in and, and increasingly depressed about because I think it's uh, that the, the reduction in insect numbers, unfortunately, is as dramatic in the United Kingdom as it is in other parts of the world. This fascination endured through school and university and she obtained a degree in agriculture at Reading University. Uh, and then when she worked as a teacher in a lecture in biology, um, she, life really changed for her completely when she got her first hive of bees, which is 40 plus years ago, and it became a passion, as it is with many of us. During the intervening years, she managed 14 hives, but this has now been reduced to two at the bottom of her garden. She obtained her national diploma in beekeeping, which is the, the highest award that any beekeeper can obtain in the United Kingdom, and indeed is a very difficult uh, diploma to attain. She obtained that in 1994. She, at various times, she has been president and secretary chairman of Warwickshire Beekeepers Association and has served in the British Beekeeper Association 
examination board and has been involved in training at all levels uh, and tutors and still tutors on a correspondence courses and is involved in examining at all levels. She has written two excellent books um, of which um, um, it's, it's really to do say with the B science and indeed they have been bestsellers here for years and I used them extensively when I was doing uh, some, what, what used to be my old intermediate level. Now she still lectures widely on beekeeping and other related subjects and writes articles for the major beekeeping journals. So really say without further ado if I could hand you over to Celia for this evening's lecture. Thank you John. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've got the same problem I had a few minutes ago. I shall have to go out and come back again, I think. Won't be a minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is always the, uh, the problem with technology. Uh, this can happen. I do hope it did. Uh, she, um, Celia did this earlier on, but in fact, she did manage to to get it sorted out fairly quickly. Just wanted to say uh, hello to Anthony from uh, upstate New York, USA. All right. Uh, I can't... Um, and Harold from Pennsylvania. And Robert from Trondheim and... Oh. No way. I think, I, I think I've seen somebody from... Uh, uh, where was I saw? There she comes. Oh, Munich. Alex from Munich. Hi. Right. Uh, right. You just uh, unmute, please, Celia. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Um, let's try sharing screens. Hope it works. That's right. It's there now. I don't know why it keeps doing that. There. Right. Okay, well thank you very much for that introduction John. Um, I always sort of prefer not to have introductions in some ways because it, it gives, it raises people's expectations shall we say and then they might be bitterly disappointed. Anyway, um, good evening everyone, good of you all to come and I'm sorry about the short delay. I hope it's not too late to wish you all a happy new year. Um, let's hope that uh, 2022 will see an improvement in, uh, in life compared to the last two years. Now, I'm going to begin this talk by asking a question. Um, and that question is, oh, come on, I've got the gremlins tonight. What is a confident beekeeper? Now, this will be only be the first of quite a few questions I shall ask you in this talk. And I've been mulling this over ever since John presented me with this title. It's not been easy. And although John said it's mainly for the, the people just starting beekeeping, which it is, it's also for those who teach them, train them. Because when we are teaching, we should always be looking at, at what we are teaching these new beekeepers and, and are we getting it right? So anyway, this, this title, my thoughts can be summed up by the following list, which you may or might not agree with. First of all, someone who is relaxed around bees. Um, and by that, I mean someone who doesn't um, run off shrieking every time a bee lands on them or even when a bee stings them. Um, they are relaxed. They feel happy around bees. So that's that's first thing I thought. And then someone who is able to help uh, sorry, to keep strong healthy colonies which survive from year to year. There is nothing more dispiriting than losing your colonies sort of every winter. And I have known people, usually people who've come along to join the association after they've been keeping bees for three or four years and you learn that every year they have lost their bees because they've just tried to do it because they think it looks so easy. Of course, we all know it isn't. Then you should not be a nuisance to others. 
it doesn't engender a lot of confidence if you're always worrying about whether your bees might fly next door and sting somebody. So that is important. And then beekeeping is fraught with a lot of problems. Um, problems arise all the time. They're not all in the books. Sometimes they're ones that other people aren't aware of or haven't seen or not the people that you're in touch with. So you need to be confident to feel that you can deal with whatever problems may present themselves along the way, even if they're somewhat unusual. unusual. And then finally, and, and I feel quite sort of passionate about this, you need to be able to take responsibility for the well-being of the bees as animals. Now, um, I have this sort of feeling that it's a pity the RSPCA don't get involved with bees. Uh, so many people have bees, put them in a box and that's it. And they don't think they need much doing to them. Um, well, in some ways they don't, but in other ways they do. And you must take responsibility for those bees and treat them as you treat any other animal because they are animals and they're quite wonderful animals, in fact. And um, so I do feel quite strongly about that. So there are a number of goals and I say you may not agree with them all or you may think of others. But how does the unsuspecting novice go about reaching these goals? And I would like to put a little aside in here. Um, I don't know what it's like in Ulster, but certainly over here, we have a number of celebrities who have jumped onto the beekeeping bandwagon. Now, some of these people are people like TV gardeners, for example, and they show a hive being put in their gardens. Usually it's a long deep hive or that kind of thing. Um, somebody comes along and dumps a swarm in it and then you never hear any more about it. And you just assume that that's it, they're beekeepers and this gives people the wrong idea. So let's look at the start of beekeeping. And I say this applies to trainers as well. How do you start to be this confident beekeeper? So the first thing you need to do is ask some questions, some more questions. Why do you want to keep bees? Well, my husband's been asking this for the last 40 plus years, and I sometimes ask myself as well. Um, but there are various answers, of course. The first one is, do you have an interest in insects and their lives? And this is where I originally came from. And this is essential. Whatever else you want to get out of your beekeeping, you need that interest. And once that interest has gone, if it goes ever, then you might as well give up because that is absolutely essential. And then a lot of people just want to make some honey. They quite fancy some honey um, on the breakfast table and they want to give some to friends and neighbours. But how much do you want to make? Um, a couple of hives, certainly enough to supply your immediate needs and those of your um, say friends and neighbours. I mean it's interesting we had um, a member who's he's still a member in fact some years ago he's in, he lives in the middle of Birmingham and he got two hives in his front garden and very early on in his beekeeping he had 250 pounds of honey from these two hives. He had um, two jars which he sent down to the National Honey Show and they won first prize in the light honey class. Now, those of you who've been to the National Honey Show uh, will know that that is a very big class. Of course, the secret is that Birmingham has got lots and lots of lime trees planted along the streets. There, there's very much a street tree. And this is what his honey was. So, you know, that's a lot of honey, actually, 250 pounds to, to sort of get rid of and eat, <laughs> eat your way through, or, you know, give it away. So you need to think, um, how much do you actually want? And of course, if you're starting to produce a lot, then you've got to think of some way of marketing it and then it becomes a different kettle of fish. Now, do you want to make money? Well, I've put think again. Um, certainly, if you want to make a lot of money, I would always advise to go and do something else. But um, it is possible to make money. It's possible to make a living from beekeeping, although it's, there's not all that many people do it in this country. There's a lot in America, of course, who make their living from it. 
you need quite a lot of hives um, and you need to work very, very hard. So, you know, I, I would not advise anyone to go into beekeeping at the beginning anyway, with the idea of making a lot of money from it. And then the final one, which increasingly I hear, is I want to help the bees or I want to help the environment. And these are both laudable aims, of course, and, and there's been so much publicity, unfortunately, about um, honeybees and their so-called plight, um, that people seem to think that they are on the verge of extinction, which of course is far from the truth. Bees, in fact, um, manage perfectly well. We've got enough beekeepers. In fact, in some places in this country, certainly there are too many beekeepers and um, honeybees aren't likely to, to, to cease to exist anytime soon. And then the environment, of course, they think, oh, it's hive of bees that will improve the environment. Well, what I say to those people is that they would be much better off planting lots of flowers for bees and for other insects, because it's not our honeybees that are in trouble, it's the wild bees and other pollinators that we need to think about. Um, and uh, I try to head those sort off uh, if that is their, their main reason. In fact, I spend a lot of my time trying to dissuade people from being beekeeping, believe it or not. <laughs> now, most people start off with, with two hives, which is the ideal. One is not a good idea because if something happens to it, that's it, gone. Whereas if you've got two, you can get a second one going from the first one. Um, and then they, of course, they make progress after that. So one thing I would say, it is important not to rush into it, but to learn a little bit first. And this is even more important. Um, I started beekeeping years before Varroa arrived and it wasn't all that difficult then, it was much easier. But I think it is important now to learn quite a bit before you start. So where do you get proper training? Well, the first place must always be beekeeping associations. Now, this is a small number of our association. Um, obviously not beekeeping. <laughs> we were actually building a new apiary. Um, but join an association, you make friends, you have lots of like-minded people you can talk to. And um, of course, one of the things that associations do is run courses and I'm sure most of you have been to beekeeping courses or you run courses yourselves. Um, this is our part of our course. It teaches you the background, it teaches you the theory, teaches you how bees tick, which is quite important, how they actually um, organise themselves in the colony and how the individual bee actually functions, which of course I personally think is quite important to know and what they need, of course, in terms of food and so on. I would say that one day or a weekend are not adequate. It needs to be longer. Um, people go on a day's training course for beekeeping and think they know a lot about bees. They don't. You cannot take it in in a day, I say, or a weekend. Taster courses are what they say. They are tasters. They enable people to get some idea of what might be involved and whether they could cope with it, but um, that is all they do. So theoretical courses, we, we do an eight week course actually, two hours um, on a Friday night for, for eight weeks, um, which, and we provide all our participants with a, a file which has got lots of what were handouts really, but they are now put into a file and index and all the rest of it. So they finish up with some material that they can keep and refer to at a later time. So that takes place in the winter time. And um, it's, of course, it doesn't replace practical experience because beekeeping is a practical subject. So then you go along to practical apiary sessions. Now, this is not our branch apiary. This is Stonely, some of you may recognize it. Uh, who've been there, and this is actually Marin and Astasov doing a demonstration. Now, what I would say about this is he is doing a demonstration. Um, I think it should be the aim of all people training novice beekeepers 
to actually supervise the novices doing things, not to actually demonstrate. All right, you can show them how to do it, but then they've got to do it themselves. That's the important thing. So associations, um, most associations have uh, their apiary. Um, it may be small, it may be big. They vary a lot in quality and size, but the real value lies mainly in the people uh, within them. And that's where the value is. So what do we need to do? There are various basic needs uh, that train from training and trainers need to take this on board. You forget if you're not careful how difficult lighting a smoker was when you first started and keeping it to light. And this is our part of our branch apiary with the, the novices lighting their smokers. And you can see they've been quite successful actually. Um, I'm amazed how many people fill up a smoker um, with fuel and then try to light it from the top. Obviously they've never lit a, a normal open fire or a bonfire or anything like that, but you always light them from the bottom. It's very fundamental, but it needs teaching. It's not enough to just assume that they can do it. And then hive tools, learn how to actually use a hive tool um, without damaging the woodwork. That's the important thing. And uh, how to do it gently so that you can crack open hives without making it too much of a crack. You need to learn how to handle bees well. This is the first prerequisite in my mind, uh, once you've learned how to light a smoker and use a hive tool, you've got to learn to handle bees well. And this is why I believe in getting um, any beginners into bees straight away and starting to teach them how to handle, how to lift out frames, how to um, put them back in again, how to, you know, all those basic things, but learn to handle them with care, gently, slowly at first, but they will speed up later on. But that is, that is also very important. And um, learning how to mark a, a queen and find a queen, first of all. Um, this is something we always teach in theory and then we, we sort of get them out and show them how to do it. Because there are methods, um, there is a fairly good method of, well, several methods of finding queens. Um, and, and, you know, people need to, to do that. I think marking the queen is most important because it means you're less likely to drop her on in the grass and, and put your foot on her. Uh, you know where she is because you can you can actually I use a, a small sort of simple new box which I put my queen on her frame into as soon as I find her when I'm going through a colony um, and then put her back in at the end of course in the same place that she came out of. But um, that is most important I think and particularly for beginners it gives them a lot more confidence if they can actually see their queen. And you can mark her using a cage, you don't have to handle her. Um, many people are, you know, quite rightly scared of handling a queen. She is fairly fragile in some ways. Um, so you can use a pushing cage, be very careful, of course, not to stick the spike through her. And you can mark her through that so that she's marked, but you haven't got a handler. And then you need to understand how bees function, both at the, um, at the individual level, uh, as this is, and at a colony level. Um, the colony level is probably more important, but you need to um, ensure that people have got some idea how they function, um, that they, you know, how they feed and this, this kind of thing. Food is vital and they must understand what uh, the bees need from the environment. This is very important when it comes to sighting hives, which we'll talk about briefly in a minute, but um, they must be aware of what bees need from their environment. So they need pollen and pollen is vitally important. Um, a range of pollens. People don't always realize just how important pollen is to the colony. 
It's what drives the expansion of the colony. It's what enables it to um, be healthy. It helps the immune system. It is extremely important and it needs to be mixed. You need lots of different sorts of pollen. And of course they need nectar um, and they need nectar all through the year, not just uh, in sort of short bursts. They need as continuous a supply as you can make through the, the active part of the year, <coughs> obviously, excuse me not in the winter but during all the spring and summer then they need water and this one was conveniently drinking from a dish but they use all sorts of water sources but they do need what and this is their need for water is part of the not being a nuisance to others um, you really need to supply some sort of water source for them near the apiary so that they don't fly off into next door's swimming pool um, or Ran their bird bath. Uh, mine used to love our bird bath, but um, they they and they don't do any harm. We know they don't do any harm, but the neighbours don't. And then they need propolis, and that is something you know you can't really worry about too much. But they will find that. But they do need propolis, so that's what our bees need. Then they also ought to understand the brood. Um, these are obviously larvae, sort of mostly fairly young larvae, one older one here, another one there, but they need to understand the um, way that a, a bee develops and how long the various stages take. And as soon as you start to get this sort of information into people, the better. Um, and, the, and the one thing that I like to stress is the um, queen, queen's life, and the eight, the importance of eight days. Um, eight is a very, very key number when it comes to queens. So those are the kinds of things that I like to get into my beginners at an early stage in their learning. So to summarize then, they need to learn how to light a smoker and use a hive tool. They need to learn how to handle bees well, how to find and mark a queen, and they need to understand something about how the colony and the individual bee function. So those I think are the main requirements at the beginning of um, someone's beekeeping career. How do you get it? Well, there are sources of information in books, online resources and other beekeepers. Now, there are a number of excellent books <coughs> And I have actually got a list here, but I'm not going to put it up on the, on the computer. You can ask about them afterwards if you want to. Um, but I would say don't be seduced necessarily by lots of pretty pictures. There are some very good, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a frog in my throat. <coughs> there are some very good and very attractive books with lots of photographs in. In fact, I've just bought one for my son-in-law's birthday, which is tomorrow. Um, a second one by Jürgen Torts and a photographer, and that is excellent. But there are others which are written by photojournalists who happen to have a girlfriend who's become a beekeeper for a year or something of that sort. And some of those, the pictures are nice, but the text is rubbish. So do be very, very careful and choose books by experienced, knowledgeable and um, British or Irish authors, um, not, I, I shouldn't, I should say this carefully, I mean there are some excellent American books, but I, I, if you're learning basic beekeeping, I think you want to learn basic beekeeping for your area, not for another part of the world. <clears throat> Online resources, um, again extreme care, I've known lots of people who've uh, started beekeeping they're very keen on computers, so they set up a website and they start putting all sorts of information on um, and they know nothing. So do be very careful with online resources. There are some excellent ones, um, some of the various ministry ones around the place. And in fact, one of the best ones is the one which your next speaker writes, which is scientificbeekeeping.com. Now, I know it's American, 
but there is so much on that website and it's very, very sound. So I do recommend that one, but there are others, but do be very careful and be careful what you get off YouTube. Although again, there are some useful things, but when you first start, you don't know what's useful and what isn't useful. So just be cautious. And finally, there's other, other beekeepers, people. Your local association, lectures such as things like this, possibly. <laughs> um various events and and again online um lectures do be careful when choosing people at a local level the ones with the most to say and the loudest voices are not always the ones worth listening to ask around listen to what they're saying and, and you'll soon learn which individuals are worth listening to. Some have qualification. Now, qualifications aren't the be all and end all, I know, but they do show that those people have been interested enough to study, to read and to learn a bit more than the absolute basic. So um, be very discerning about that. I want to say a word on mentoring. I'm not a great fan of mentoring. This is mentoring on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, I've seen it in operation and it can be very good. But many mentors, um, first of all, don't have sufficient experience or knowledge to really teach anyone, or they may not have the ability to teach people. And secondly, the other thing I've seen more often probably is mentors who take over. Because mentors are usually busy people. They've got lots of hives of their own. And beginners, by definition, are slow. They take time and you've got to allow them to take that time. So they sort of dash in. They do whatever needs doing. And the poor old mentee doesn't get a look in. Um, and then you get to the stage where the, the novice beekeeper doesn't feel confident enough to do anything on their own, to be honest, because they haven't been able to actually physically do it. They have always watched it being done. So just be careful. We choose a system where a number of us who, who teach in the association um, supply our phone numbers and email addresses to people so they can always get in touch with one of us or more than one of us. And um, and, and sort things out. And sometimes we have to go out to their acres, yes, but not all that often. Right, so those are the sorts of um, basic things, where you can get information and so on. So now we have some more questions. I told you there'd be lots of questions. I'm always full of questions. I don't always know the answers, but I'm always full of questions. And first of all, very important things, where will I keep my bees? Now, this is a very important question, of course, and, and most people who start beekeeping just have a vision of two hives at the bottom of the garden. Now, that's what I've got now, because since I've got old and we've also moved house and um, we have a much smaller garden, I've now just got my two cons bees, which is lovely. And um, if I'm lucky, I face our back garden faces fields for as far as you can see. I've only got one set of neighbours, really, um, and, and so that's very good. But you've got to think about it. If you're going to keep your bees very near to other people, then you've got to take steps to actually make sure that they don't interfere with those people. So putting up screens and providing water, as I've said, all these kinds of things. Um, so these are the kinds of things that people can advise on, but you do have to be a bit careful here. Will the bees have enough forage in the area I've chosen? And that's difficult to know until you've kept bees there. But one thing you can perhaps try and estimate, and you can get this usually from your association or get some idea, is how many bees there are in the area, how many hives, because this can be a problem. Um, we're seeing it over here in London, um, where yields have gone down, there's an awful lot of EFB and other diseases, and there are far too many bees in the middle of London. It's 
to some extent due to people wanting to help the environment and lots of companies putting a couple of hives on top of a building. Um, and, the, you know, you, you've only got two hives, somebody else has got four hives, but the numbers mount up. So this can be cause of a loss of, of uh, or lack of forage, particularly pollen. Um, flowers will carry on producing nectar, uh, even though it's been taken away, they'll produce some more. But they will only produce a finite amount of pollen. And pollen is so important. Once that pollen's gone, it's gone. So the numbers of hives is important. And finally, when you've thought about the bees and you've thought about other people, think about yourself. Are they in an accessible place? Can you get at them? Can you get some means of transporting heavy supers, for example? Um, even if it's only from the bottom of your garden, they can be quite heavy and you don't want to be carrying them. And they're fairly ungainly things to carry as well. So your own well-being is important as well. And then the second question is what design of hive will I use? Now, there are lots of these. They include all the standard wooden ones, which of which there are several different sizes. Polyhives, of course. Um, then there are all the things associated with natural beekeeping, all sorts of weird and wonderful things there. Flow hives, warre hives, all sorts of things. I encourage people who are beginning beekeeping to start off with a standard hive of some sort. They might want to change later on, but I really think the standard hive of some kind is important. Now, of course, over much of the world, the Langstroth is the um, hive of choice. I find them quite heavy and I have looked after a couple of Langstroth. I looked after, after a couple of them for several years for a friend um, some time ago now. I couldn't lift a Langstroth brood box. Now, admittedly, I'm quite small and obviously female, but it's something to think about, weight, because um, Hives do get heavy, as we all know, and they get heavier as you get older. So need to think about that. The only way to decide this really is to talk to other people. Look at different hives. And again, this is your association can help here and going to other apiaries because that is important as well. You know, visit as many apiaries as you can when you start. You will see lots of things which aren't good, but you will still learn from those and think, well, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> so you will know not to do it yourself. Um, so do think about that very hard. Um, it is important at the start to get it right. You also need to choose something that you can get equipment for easily, um, that you can buy frames for and foundation and, and boxes and so on, because you don't want some weird and wonderful thing that you have a, a job to buy any extras for. Um, and then what extra equipment do I need? You will need extra equipment. You may have, if you've only got one hive, you will need another brood box, floor, crown board, so that you can actually um, control swarming. We'll come to that later. But you need to think what you need and get it. And then there will be other stuff which you haven't even thought about. So there'll be feeders and there the may be varroa treatments. Um, all sorts of things like that. You need to talk to people, you need to know what you want and get it before you desperately need it. That's the important thing. So you've done the course, you've been to the local association apiary for practical sessions and you know everything there is to know about bees. Now you're waiting for your first bees, that's all you want and you're away. So how are you going to get those bees? Another question, well, you can either have a nucleus, you can get a swarm, or you can buy a second-hand hive with bees in it. Um, the nucleus, first of all, I encourage people to start with the nucleus. I started with the nucleus um, a long time ago, but wonderful way to start. They're small, half the size of a, of a full colony, so they are always friendly. Um, and you can grow with your nucleus. You don't have to sort of take on a whole colony to start with. If you get it locally, and I would always urge people to get them locally, um, 
a, a big study that was carried out by COLOS, which is an international um, association of research scientists, really, be all beekeepers and, and beekeeping researchers, have quite clearly demonstrated that the best bees for your area are the bees from your area. They are adapted um, for that area and they will do better. You might think that getting them from somewhere else you'll get a better bee, but you won't. You might need to improve them, but get them from your own area. If you get one locally as well, you've got somewhere you can go, you've got somewhere, somebody's door you can hammer on and say, hey, I need something doing about this is not right. Um, it's a much better prospect. And although a nucleus will cost you money, it will cost you less if you buy from your association or locally than if you, you buy off the web or somewhere like that. You can get a swarm. Someone will capture a swarm for you because obviously they are they fly about in the summer in May and June and they will bring them to your hive and put them in your hive for you, <clears throat> which is which sounds really good because it's free. You don't actually know what you're getting, that's the problem. <clears throat> you, you may have a, a swarm which is a disease. Now most swarms are fairly healthy, but they can carry disease. You may have a very defensive um, strain of bee in that swarm, which makes it very difficult to handle. Your nucleus will be bred by someone who ensures, hopefully ensures that it is, it is quiet and, and good tempered and with a marked queen incidentally. Whereas a swarm, you will have this, I mean, that swarm isn't as big as a full colony perhaps, but you might still have 20, 25,000 bees in it. And they can be, as I say, um, very defensive. And uh, you, it's very unlikely you'll have a marked queen in it, although sometimes you do. So that's the swarm. And then the final one is a second-hand hive full of bees. Now this sounds a very attractive option, um, but in truth, it's something that needs to be done with great care. Um, again, you can import um, a lot of disease in this way. Uh, you need to think why people are getting rid of the, that hive. I mean, it may just be that they, they are having to um, reduce their numbers of, of bees for various reasons, and it may be perfectly genuine. Um, it may be that they're lousy beekeepers and they can't cope with them. They feel they've got to get rid of them. All sorts of different reasons. If you are tempted down this route, then always take an experienced beekeeper with you to look at them and never buy anything that you can't inspect. And it applies to all of these. I mean, the swarm isn't going to be a problem anyway, but it applies to the nucleus and the second hand hive, particularly the second hand hive. Never buy bees in the autumn or late summer. Always buy them in the spring. I have known quite a few people who bought um, second hand hives with bees so they can start beekeeping. They take delivery in August or sometime like that. The weather's nice, you know, they're all fine. Put them down and by the spring they're dead. They probably overrun with varroa, they may have other diseases, all sorts of problems. It's very, very dispiriting for people to do that. So you really do need to um, take that on board. And uh, although it can be a, a successful way of doing things, you must be careful. So there you go, you're on your way. And you can now call yourself a beekeeper, or at least a bee owner. And at this point, many people think they've achieved their goal and can carry on with no more help or advice. They believe they know everything there is to know about bees, but how wrong can you be? And so I'm gonna pause here and look at two particular um, challenges, shall we say. If you can deal successfully with these two, then confidence will grow. The first thing is swarming. Now swarming, of course, is a natural process. It's part of the bee's life cycle and the bees want to swarm. Not all the time, but certainly once a year. 
Um, it's their way of reproducing, of course, their colony. So they need to do it to be successful. And it's no good starting off and thinking, if my bees swarm, just start off and think they will swarm at some stage. It may not be your first year. And in fact, if you start off with a nucleus, in all eventuality, they won't swarm the first year. If you start off with a swarm or a secondhand colony, then they might do. If a swarm, already swarmed once, unless it's a very swarmy sort of strain of bee, it shouldn't swarm again. The secondhand colony in the hive probably will swarm. So that's something that um, you do need to consider. But why do you need to worry about it? Well, it's probably the single biggest threat to neighbourly relations. I never understand it, but some people do take exception to having sort of 20 or 30,000 bees flying around their back garden. Um, I mean, to us, it seems a perfectly happy situation, but not to them. Um, and especially if it goes into their chimney uh, or into their cavity wall or somewhere like that or into their shed. And then a lost swarm, it, it may be a lost honey crop from that colony. It will certainly be a reduced honey crop from that colony because, of course, a lot of bees will have left home and they will have taken um, food with them. They will have filled up their their honey stomachs before they go and um, and so you, you that will really reduce your honey crop and then finally if you manage to see it catching and hiving it can be difficult because they sometimes take to collecting at the tops of trees um, sometimes quite tall dangerous trees which uh, they're probably just better left to their own devices in that uh, situation and it's always time consuming and they always seem to swarm around lunchtime. Um, very inconvenient. But I've always found actually that um, when you go out to collect swarms, I mean, it's not your swarms necessarily, somebody else's swarm, you go out to collect them. They always take off and go five minutes before you get there. Um, and this <laughs> brought home to me very strongly one, one year. I, was called out to a swarm and it was a lady she was actually nine months pregnant and this swarm was just outside her back door and she'd been fascinated by it but the midwife said she must get somebody to remove it so I went out to remove it and she was some short distance away and um, I said how long has it been there she's always been here a week and I said oh it's not going to go anywhere uh, I said so I, it was lunchtime I said, I'll just eat me lunch and then I'll be out so I did that went there when I got there she said, it's gone. I said, well, when did it go? She said, oh, about 10 minutes ago. So, you know, this is amazing what bees do. They're not supposed to do that. So there you go. Um, so before you go very far, you must decide on a plan. Now, of course, you can preempt swarming to some extent by providing extra space, uh, making sure your bees are always provided with extra space ahead of when they need it. You can split them. You can actually um, split your colonies so that they um, don't really uh, have the chance to swarm. They're going to make themselves a new queen. They'll probably think they have swarmed. Um, but sooner or later, you will open a colony and find occupied queen cells. So make a plan beforehand. Know what you're going to do when you see those occupied. I'll put if there, but I should have put when really, when you see occupied queen cells and buy the equipment you need for it. There are different ways of controlling swarms. They all basically come to the same thing. You separate one element of the colony from the others. So you can separate the queen out or you can separate the, the young bees out, it, it, whatever. But um, you need some equipment to do it. So buy the equipment you need. And when you actually do this, if necessary, write yourself an idiot list. And that's what I call an idiot list. I'm a great believer in idiot lists. And this is a list that you write down in the cold light of day, sitting at your kitchen table or whatever. And you just put um, a list of the things you're going to, if you're doing a pattern, for example, an artificial swarm, you actually put on your list, you put move hive to one side, put new hive in place. 
move queen on frame from old hive to new hive. And, and that's how you go up. And that's your idiot list. You put it somewhere near you on top of another hive or somewhere um, with a stone on top so it doesn't blow away. And then even when you're surrounded by loads of bees and you really don't know what you're doing, you can actually refer to it and you know exactly what you've got to do next. So that's what I call an idiot list. Um, it's a list for idiots and, and it works really well. <laughs> Um, I use a nuke method. I take the queen out and put her in a nuke and make up a small nuke. It's, it's, that's a five frame nuke, which normally only got three frames in it when I do it. Um, and, um, and that works very well, but there are other methods as well. So the beauty of this, all it needs to do it is an extra nuke, nuke box, not a whole colony. That grass there, of course, is to stop the bees from in there going back to there to their old home that stays for a couple of days and then it all wilts and they can get out. So that's what I'm going to say about swarming. I'm not going to go into detail because I've got time in this talk, but um, it is important to have a plan and to think about it beforehand. And then the second thing I'm going to just mention is Varroa. Varroa destructor. There they are. Horrible little things, aren't they? Um, but it is very important. And of course, it's important that people take on board um, what they need to do about Varroa really right from the outset, because if they don't, they will lose their bees um, almost inevitably. So you must keep Varroa to a minimum in your hives. You want to keep it down below a thousand mites per hive. Gets above that, then you're in trouble. And of course, it's the viruses that it spreads that will get going and they will eventually kill your bees. They might take a couple of three years over it, but they will kill the bees. Now, there are a number of ways of dealing with Varroa. Oh, there you go, I'll put a pupa in just to show you. They feed on the fat body, which is the food stores, basically. That's a, a mother mite and that's one of her daughters. Um, you know, they pierce the, uh, the cuticle of the pupa and suck out the um, fat body which obviously doesn't do it a lot of good. So how can we control it? Well, you can use husbandry methods and those exploit two facts. The first is that mites only go into cells to breed just before those cells are capped. So if you provide them um, with a frame of cells at that stage and those are the only ones in the hive then they'll have to go in there and you can effectively trap them because once they're capped over they're trapped so the, the, there's a way of using that but i'm not going to go into it in detail because it's it's too long for now so that's one thing and then the other thing is that they uh, between breeding cycles they are on the adult bees they're called phoretic mites when they're in that state and they feed on those adult bees. But at that stage, they are far more vulnerable. Um, and at that stage, you can use various things to, to get rid of them. So there's husbandry methods. Then there's chemical treatments, which is what most people tend to use. Now, these are very varied. Um, there are a large number now on the market, and uh, some are kinder than others. Some have quite sort of well, not serious effects on bees, but they can certainly affect bees. I mean, it's very interesting that, you know, you, if you're using chemical, you're trying to kill a mite, which is quite similar to an insect, um, on another insect, which all right, it's a bit bigger, but, you know, it, it is still quite difficult to do. So some of those chemicals are kinder to the bees than others. Many of them are absorbed into wax. So they go on persisting in the colony after the treatment has been taken out. I think we must stress on beginners that they must use registered products and follow the instructions carefully. Um, it is quite important. And of course, the, the different treatments have different methods of, of application. The only um, instructions I tend not to follow is the ones on Max, the Mitoweight Quick Strip. Um, and I tend to, if I, I don't use them very often, 
on me, but if I do use them, I tend to use only one rather than the two that it says. It's, it's quite a sort of powerful, pungent stuff. Um, it will actually uh, penetrate um, brood capping, so it's quite useful from that point of view. But um, it was developed in the, for the American market where they tend to work on a double Langstroth brood box. Now, I use nationals, single brood box nationals, as do many people, in, uh, certainly in this country. Um, and they are really, I think, too strong for that particular type of hive. It can win, uh, it can work, but it doesn't always, and, and it can lead to loss of queens. Now, you can use what's called integrated piss management, which is a combination of the two. It's mainly husbandry methods, really, but with the backup of a chemical treatment if you need it. Um, and to, do, to know whether you need it, you have to monitor, of course. And all these things must be grasped right at the outset. And then the final method is to cross your fingers and hope for the best. Um, and this really doesn't work. There are areas around the UK, uh, and I'm sure in, in Ireland as well, where varroa tolerant mites are found and, and people haven't used chemicals for some time, several years in some cases. And this is great. And, and some of the work that's going on, I mean, Steve Martin has been um, working on this now for some time and has this discovered a way that some bees are able to combat varroa and uh, therefore remain healthy. But you've got to be prepared to monitor carefully if you're going to go down this route. Don't just assume that it will happen if you stop treating. And you have to be prepared to apply some sort of control if the numbers start to climb. So that's sort of, um, I think people have got to grasp varroa control and, uh, and the importance of varroa right from the outset. Now I'm just gonna look to finish up, I'm gonna look at one more aspect of beekeeping, which isn't entirely aimed at um, complete novices, and that is queen rearing, rear your own queens. Now I've put this in because it gives the opportunity to really feel as if you are in charge. This, this does engender confidence. And secondly, it gives you a much better understanding of bees. Um, it also gives you the chance to improve your bees, of course. Now I'm not going to go into queen rearing methods. You, you can get terribly, terribly hung up on which method to use and how to do it. Let me just say that there are basic principles. These are queen cells, artificially reared queen cells. This is a Genta kit, which, which I use because the old eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Um, and it's much easier to get the larvae of the right age. But the essentials are, you must use worker larvae because of course worker larvae can be converted to queens queen larvae, but they must be 12 hours old or less. They must be tiny. Um, general rule of thumb is if you can see them, they're too big, uh, which is why I use a Genta kit. Um, so you finish up, you know, it's probably better to use one of these um, head torches and, and magnifiers. That's a good way of doing it. But they must be uh, 12 hours old or less. Now, the Problem with different methods is actually obtaining those larvae. Once you've obtained those, it, it's, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, then you must have a queenless colony. A, a queenless colony, which hasn't got any queen cells of its own, will adopt and rear them as queens. So you have to um, render a colony queenless, or at least let it think it's queenless, and then they will adopt and rear them. But it must be very well fed and have lots of young bees in it, nurse bees, which will look after those larvae and feed them. Um, and again, pollen is particularly important because it is pollen which provides all the protein uh, and other things as well, but all the protein which will enable those larvae to grow. And without lots and lots of pollen, they will never grow as well as they should and your queens won't be quite as good as they should. So um, that is very important. So those are basics. and then. Before the cells actually emerge, before the queens emerge, you must put each sealed cell into its own nucleus box or into a, a, a box anyway, some sort of box. Some people use mini nukes, little tiny things, 
Some people use ordinary nukes, which is what I use. Um, you can put them into brood boxes, but um, they're better in many ways in a smallish colony, not a great huge one. Um, and then they will mate from those nukes and uh, you will have a lot of, of really good queens, hopefully, or a few anyway. We don't need a lot. Um, but carrying out this procedure will lead to lots of reading, greater insights into the life of the hive. Um, and of course, because it's such a it's a rigid timetable, you have to really get yourself organized. And I think it, it, it is a really, really good process, even if you're not a terribly successful queen rear. And I remember when I first started, I didn't rear very many out of each batch. Um, but I would recommend any beekeeper who's got a year or two of experience to try it um, and, and they will improve their beekeeping. Now, as you gain in experience, um, you may want to expand uh, and your enterprise gets bigger, but then you need to have a few um, considerations. Never expand beyond your capacity to care for the animals in your charge. Um, it's very easy. Hives can be multiplied up quite rapidly, um, but you must realise that dealing with 20 colonies is altogether different to dealing with two. And similarly, dealing with 50 and 100 and so on. Um, it all escalates if you're not careful and you're running around um, like a headless chicken trying to keep up and everything becomes quite chaotic. So do be very careful if you're expanding. The other thing you need to think about, of course, which is not beekeeping as such, if you're expanding, you've got to do something with all that honey. So you've got to sell it. So marketing becomes important. And this is another thing to take on board and another thing to take up time and effort. So do think very hard before you expand. Now, it's my experience that a lifetime is too short to learn everything. Um, unfortunately, I didn't start until halfway through my life anyway, but or nearly halfway. But new research is always going on um, and there are amazing discoveries being made all the time. It's very difficult to keep up with it all. And then no two seasons are alike. Um, we had a very strange season this, this year and no two, or last year rather now, isn't it? And no two colonies are alike either. So there is all this variation and you carry on learning. So you need to carry on reading visit as many acres as you can, talk to people. And remember that it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. But the important thing is not to stop questioning. Keep asking those questions, very, very important. So thank you very much for listening. I hope some of you are still there. Um, and I hope that may have been of use to some of you. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed, Celia. That was very interesting, very good, and I hope it's of, uh, of great value to a lot of the uh, newer beekeepers that we have in the audience. Um, really, say if I would uh, really like to say to to start off the questions and um, and really say ask you. I mean, do you use bait hives? No. Nope. Explain what they are. <laughs> It's a simple answer. No, I've never used base hives. Um, I, as I say now, I'm, I'm, I mean, I used to keep my hives, um, used to have quite a few. I had two acres. I had my home apiary, which is that one you saw in the last slide there, um, which isn't my home apiary anymore because we've moved house. And I also had an out apiary, um, both of them in rural situations where, you know, losing a swarm wasn't the end of the world, not from the point of view of the people, but, um, I've always used the um, nucleus method of swarm control. And I have a nucleus, or I had a nucleus, my, my daughter and son-in-law have got it now, um, which is a triple nuke. So it's, it's one ordinary brood box divided into three, uh, with obviously entrances in different directions. And um, at the beginning of the season, I always used to take that down to my out apiary, put it in the out apiary so that it was ready. So as soon as I found any queen cells, occupied queen cells, that queen came out and into the nuke. 
um, with a nucleus. And um, I found that system worked very well. The nucleus method is good because it fits in to a seven day um, inspection period because you take the queen out one week, make sure there are no seal queen cells, but leave everything else. And then a week later, you go back and you take off all the queen cells except one um, and, um, and make sure there's no emergency ones. And, and that, that actually works a treat. So that's what I used to do. And I still, I still use that method now. Um, and actually, I, 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 I shouldn't say this because you know what might happen this year, but I, I can't remember the last time I had a, a swarm actually come out. Um, but, you know, there you go. Perhaps I've been lucky. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, Sonia, I think it's, uh, I've got a question here from Jim Lawson. And he said, Celia says, to only use registered treatment products. But when I asked my association disease expert about the difference between the expensive apobioxyl and regular oxalic acid, mm. he says none, apart from some glycerine. Mm. Why are manufacturers of expensive apobioxyl or oxy B being protected by law? <laughs> I can't answer that question. It is very true. Um, I mean, it is, if you just buy oxalic acid, which you can buy and do it yourself, that is illegal. If you use apiboxyl or you're on octavar, isn't it? I, then that is, that is not illegal. I don't understand that either, but that's what the law says. And when I'm talking to lots of people like this, I mean, there's 250 of them out there, apparently, I'm not going to tell them to break the law. So, um, I think the the only advice one can give is to use registered products. And of course, you are supposed to, well, you, you are, you know, it's it necessary by law to record what you've used in your hive. Um, these are classified as food producing animals. And um, you have to record what chemicals you've used, what you've put in, where they came from, what their um, expiry date was and, and so on. So, of course, if you're going to use stuff which isn't actually registered, even though it's the same product, you can't actually do that, can you? You can't record it properly because you can't record where you've had it from. Well, you can, but, you know, you haven't had it from a proper supplier. So I don't know, but it, it, it is an annoying one. But, you know, that's life, isn't it? <laughs> right. uh, uh, maybe, in, in fact, I could probably make a comment or two on that particular one. By the way, so I'm actually meant to say at the very beginning is that my name is John Hill and I'm chairman of the Ulster Beekeepers Association. <laughs> I noticed at the very beginning, but I think maybe some people may have missed that. Uh, but just really, just to this particular question, uh, I'm actually a retired veterinary surgeon. And in fact, uh, I know a little bit about the law regarding sort of medicines. Mm. And and the problem the problem really is is that why I say some products do appear to be very expensive is because the company itself um, has had to spend a huge amount of money putting yeah. together a campaign which is put to a body called the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, mm -hmm. and they actually license drugs for use on animals. Now it's not only just for bees; it could be for cattle, sheep, pigs dogs, cats, whatever. And unfortunately, it does take a great deal of money to, to bring this data together and, and for them to be allowed to, uh, or for them to be able to obtain a license and be allowed to sell it under that license. And therefore that means that the costs go up. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why registered medicines do appear to be a great deal more expensive than what we would call the generic compounds. So like um, uh, generic oxalic acid will in fact be much, much cheaper, but it's not in a registered package. It's not in a registered um, instructions the, and all that type of thing that goes with it. So unfortunately, that is the reason that uh, to comply with the law, you have to uh, go along with the licensing uh, conditions and that really is the reason why they're much more mm -hmm. expensive okay so I didn't mean to take a hour from you Celia but uh, I think that's just the way it is if we get yep. on to another question here um, uh, I think Bernadette O'Kane is asking about uh, what does the 8 Fridays course start 
Um, I think that's what to do, say, if she contacts somebody in the Ulster Beekeepers, they'll be able to find out when um, the um, uh, introduction to beekeeping courses are taking place and uh, that, that can happen. So that would not be really for, for Celia. But I have one here uh, from, um, uh, from my very good wife, in fact, and uh, from Susie, and she says, how long did it take you to write your wonderful books? <laughs> and have you got a book in, 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 uh, in the, uh, in, 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 you know, in, uh, on coming on writing? I think I should mention that the two books are The Honey Bee uh, Inside Out and The Honey Bee uh, Round and About, of which I understand you're on the third edition. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're on the third edition of both of them. How long did it take me to write them? Um, in each case, it took a year. Um, the, because the problem was, I mean, I never set out to write books. But I wrote for years. I mean, I'm a friend of Claire Waring's, um, who edited Beecraft for, for many years. And she asked me if I would write articles for Beecraft on the biology of bees, the difficult bits that people didn't understand. So like a fool, I said yes. And I did that for 10 years. Um, and then I came under some pressure from various other, shall we call them friends, um, I'm not sure that's the right description, um, who pressured me to write a book. But of course it wasn't all that simple because I, I mean, you can't just take articles and just stick them in a book and that's it. And I hadn't done the diagrams because I, I sort of referred people, I've been a bit lazy here, but I, I didn't think it was worth taking up space in Beecraft with diagrams which could be found perfectly well in, a, in another book. So I used to refer people to Dade or um, not grass or, or whatever um, to, to diagrams and so I had to do all the diagrams I had to do all the dissections and, and everything else so it, it took me a year um, to do each one um, and actually it takes quite a long time to bring out the, the new editions because like I kind of say you say we're on the third edition um, and you think oh no that's easy enough but it it does take time you've got to go through everything and check everything and Put new stuff in so it takes that takes quite a while as well so it's quite time consuming um and it's nice because they seem to have done quite well but you know i don't know is it something i could spend my whole time doing <laughs> right. well, well I, I, I can certainly highly recommend them because as i say i think that your, your diagrams and everything in them are are, uh, are very easy to understand and, and to the point. Okay. Yes. Anyway, the, the, the next question is from Ethel Irvine and she, um, uh, she asked, and what records would you advise new beekeepers to keep? Ah, didn't mention records, did I? Um, well, records are a personal thing, I feel. Um, I keep my records, I'm a fairly simple soul, so I have sheets which I run off on the computer each year uh, with the date on the top and just a series of columns. I think you need to keep records which show you week by week what you are doing because you don't remember. Well, I don't remember. Um, so you need to know what you're doing. You need to know whether there's a queen there. You might not see her, but you can put eggs if you don't see a queen. Um, you need to know when you first start, I think it's useful to, to keep a track of how much, uh, how many frames of brood you've got. Um, you need to keep track of how much food there is, um, the temper of the colony, all these kinds of things, but it's up to you to decide what you want. And all I do, I have a sheet, which is, has got columns in it. And each um, column simply has a tick or a single letter. So um, if I see well, the column that's headed queen, for example, if I actually see the queen, it's got a tick. If I don't see it, but there are eggs, I'll put an E. Um, there's obviously a column for queen cells. And you, you just sort of, if you've got some, you tick it and put whether it's got an egg or a larva in it. Um, or in the worst situation, whether it's sealed. Um, all those kinds of things. And I also think it's very important, and this is particularly important if you have an out apiary where you haven't got a shed to store stuff in to have a column for needs, what they need next time, so that you actually know what you've got to take to those hives and what you've got to add to them. So it may be an extra super or, 
or some food or whatever it might be, but you, you can actually put that in needs. And of course, a column for honey, um, how much honey you extract. And then those are very important on a week to week basis, but they're also important when you look through that uh, record at the end of the year so that you can see which colonies have done what and you've got a, a summary to start you off the next year. And if you are rearing queens, you can see which colonies you want to rear queens from. So that's what I say. I don't sort of lay down any hard or fast rules. I've seen all sorts of records when I've been examining people. Um, you know, some very, very fancy, some of them do them on the computer. Personally, I haven't got time for that. I just, um, I have my sheet, I, I, and it's in a folder, it's in a white clean folder because they get mucky. Um, it usually sits on top of another hive. Well, I go through the one hive, and I close that up, I smoke the next hive, and while that's sort of settling down, I fill in my sheet, and that's done. Um, and that's it, and I don't expect to have to do anything on the computer or anything else. It depends on your own personal preference. That's me, I, I know if I'd got to go and fill it in on the computer, it would get left. So it wouldn't get done, <laughs> it wouldn't get transcribed. So I just do it in the simplest way I can. And, and that works well for me. Um, we do a very similar thing at our branch apiary, which seems to work down there where we have different people doing things. So we have to know, you have to be able to see what's happened very clearly so that you know what to do next. Um, but it's up to you what you want. But as I say, when you, when you first start, it's probably worth having extra columns which tell you how many frames of things you've got. So you can see how a colony builds up uh, and what's happening in there. Right, the next question is from Roberta. And she says, when you say get bees that are local to you, what? how local is local? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I can't put a mileage on it, but sort of fairly local. I mean, um, I now live, oh, I don't know, getting on for 20 miles away from our branch apiary, but I would regard that as local. Um, I, I, I don't know. I've never thought about that, to be honest, just fairly local. What I'm really saying is um, if you live in, um, well, I live in the Midlands, then don't get your bees from Scotland or from Cornwall, uh, particularly not Cornwall, because they'll be all soft down there and they'll be used to warmer climate. And certainly okay. don't go buying them from I don't know, Greece or, you know, wherever. Um, it, it, it's a strange one, actually. I mean, because people are buying queens um, from all over the place. And, and I think it's a sort of the grass is greener on the other side of the fence sort of attitude, you know. And of course, the most popular bee in the, in the world, in many ways, well, certainly, no, perhaps not in the world, but certainly in the States and so on, is the Italian bee, which is very productive doesn't work terribly well I found in this country I, I've never bought queens in but we had um we had Italian queens down to our branch apiary one year we had an a, uh, apiary uh, manager who insisted on buying in Italian queens um oh and they were beautiful they looked nice you could handle them they made lots and lots of queens so we could make lots of nukes up for all the beginners had them um terribly difficult to feed them for the winter because as soon as you gave them some food, they thought, oh, smashing some more brood. And they just turned it into brood. Um, but we did manage to get them through the winter, unfortunately. And then, um, oh, I think it was about two years later, once they'd all thoroughly made it out, they were absolutely unhandleable. And they were really, really nasty. And this, I think, is something that happens quite frequently. And I hear it from people who sidle up to you after lectures and say, I don't know whether you can help me. I had these lovely bees. They were whatever they were, Carney or it doesn't matter what they are. And now they're really nasty and I can't do anything with them. You know, what, what, what's happened to them? And I think it's just simple hybrid vigour. Um, you know, a, a defensive bee is a successful bee in, in the eyes of a bee in the bee world in a wild situation, but of course not in an apiary. So I... Apart from the, the risk as well of importing diseases and pests and small hive beetle, which we haven't got yet, we hope. Um, you know, I just don't see the point. Improve what you've got and buy fairly locally. 
Um, and, and that would be my advice. But I can't put a mileage on it, you know, you've just got to be common sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the next question is from Kieran. And he said, how much water should I leave out per hive? Can I leave in a bucket or do I need to change the water regularly? Well, you don't need a lot. Um, they, you don't want a bucket. <laughs> you just want a, a, a bowl or a, some sort of shallow container. Make sure that you've got um, things in it so that the bees can sit on something and won't drown. Um, because they are quite good at doing the breaststroke, actually. I've seen them in the pool, but it's not a good idea. I don't think it does them a lot of good. So you just want a very shallow container somewhere, uh, fairly near to the apiary, not sort of right against them, but fairly close. And um, some people put, um, I've seen all sorts of setups, people put um, dishes full of um, sort of peat or something like that, or we don't use peat anymore, but whatever you can use. Um, moss or whatever and have, have something dripping into it or just keep it really so because they don't need a lot of water they just need sufficient that they can suck up um, from some sort of material so um, no certainly not a bucket <laughs> and no, yes you can change the water you, yeah. Sorry? you'll get too yeah. many with drying I think that you need yeah. to say, uh, use a, uh, a flat dish of plenty of pebbles. Yeah, flat, just a flat dish and, and is, is fine, actually. I mean, that one I'd got the picture of was drinking. It wasn't one of mine or anything. It was actually on holiday in Norfolk. And it was a hive there in the grounds of the place. And um, this chap used to put, he wasn't a beekeeper, his chap has owned it. He just used to put this dish out um, during the day with water in, just because he liked the bee seeing the bees drinking from it. And, and they used to come and drink from it. And it was um, it was lovely for them actually, but it was just a shallow container of any sort. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, um, uh, see, I think I'll make this the last question, and uh, it's from Ian, and uh, he said, not particularly related to the talk, <laughs> but in what configuration do you overwinter your hives? Varroa tray in or out, entrance block in or out, crown board feed holes open or blanked? I, <laughs> that's only that's about five questions i'm gonna say <laughs> i'll start from the bottom um ventilated floor um draw normally the, the you know the varroa tray normally out although as i put it in for monitoring um at, at fairly frequent intervals um then i've taken to i i, I used to keep my bees on a brood and a half but I just keep them on a single brood now, but I do leave them with a super on each winter. Now I've, I've taken to, it doesn't seem right actually to me still because bees normally store their food above their brood, but I've taken to putting the half um, brood, the shallow super under the brood box. So you've got ventilated floor, you've got a shallow super, then you've got a um, brood box. The um, crown board, uh, has I, I put gauze over the um, feed holes but then I insulate above that I always put insulation for the winter on top of the crown but I think if you've got a ventilated floor at the bottom you need that insulation on top um, I actually use um, I've got some under felt well, it's not felt it's this corrugated sort of stuff that, that they use for under carpets nowadays and I have three layers of that on top of each hive and then the roof on top of that. Um, that's how I overwinter them. I'm seriously considering whether to try insulating around the outside of the hive itself next year, well, the two hives. Um, I don't know whether I'll do that or not. And it, it all depends, I've got to think about that, but I'm seriously considering doing that. Um, if you've got, I mean, mine are in a fairly windy situation. I mean, we face due south and we're very open so that we get quite a lot of winds. But I, I have put up a windbreak and I've planted a hedge as well, which is now growing quite quickly. Um, just front of them so they are a bit more protected. But if you're worried about wind, the other way of doing it is to, um, is to put an um, empty super underneath the bottom box so it acts as a sort of skirt around the thing to sort of keep the, 
the wind out. So I, I haven't done that, but you can do that as well. So, but that's how I overwinter mine. Right. Okay. Well, 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 Celia, thank you very, very much indeed. That was a very informative talk, uh, very straightforward. And I have to say, very easy to understand. So I do hope that everybody gained a great deal from that. And as I say again, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, our webinar next week is from Randy Oliver uh, from California. And uh, he will be uh, giving us a talk on uh, nukes and how best to use them. Um, uh, as it happens, I was talking to Randy today, I rang him because I, um, um, I hadn't actually been able to, to catch him, in fact, so he hadn't, he hadn't responded to me. But in fact, uh, he, he has been in the middle of a major snowstorm in, in California, and he's had all sorts of problems with uh, trees dying and, um, and damage to, to property and so forth. However, he is, uh, he is all set up to, to lecture to us. Uh, this time next week, so it'll be eight o'clock uh, coming uh, this next coming um, Wednesday. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank uh, thank you all very much for for uh, turning up, and I look forward to seeing you at our at our future webinars over this next number of weeks. Thank you very much indeed. Good night. <laughs>